This is the first of six events, the majority of which are actually scheduled for next spring. Um, Romanticide, Love, Loss, and Codependency in Contemporary Art and Cultural Politics is a series that frames a number of questions in the language of a tumultuous uh, and certainly dysfunctional romantic relationship. I offer the melodramatic tone as a nod to the rather hysterical insistence that artwork associated with the Middle East is marked by crisis while remaining politically impotent or innocent. The perceived political harmlessness of the artist and their intellectual currency, often defined as critical and progressive, makes them an attractive catch for nation building, institution building, and humanitarian initiatives, which would align them uh, which would align themselves with these virtues. Um, by the same token, the art world gains a language with which to validate its integrity and its significance with certain approaches to image making. I offer the damned romance, then, as a characterization of this long-standing affair between art practice and those institutions that claim to speak in the name of the nation, the individual, or humanity. This evening's panel specifically addresses the latter. That is the implication of contemporary art within a human rights discourse and the other way around, or vice versa. In the context of the Middle East, um, artworks have often been drawn on by the institutions that claim to offer political and cultural so or social solutions to reveal and subsequently mystify situations of crisis. At the same time, a vocabulary of trauma and marginality and an aesthetics of catastrophe and issues are especially resonant in the art world today. The questions that inform this discussion might include, how does artwork acquire the moral value invested in human rights work while depending on diaspora privileges and access to the international art world? Under what conditions do challenging positions or old school revolutionary veneer get rewarded? In what sense is an artwork's ability to speak to issues or be, instru or be instrumental in this regard championed and or disavowed, made legible or illegible in different contexts? And can artwork both partake in and undermine the official representations of issues? These questions and the relationships they entail, I would argue, have increasingly been the focus of critical engagement within art practice itself. It is with a note of optimism, then, that I titled this evening's panel, Ending the Affair, Contemporary Art and Human Rights. I hope the panel will produce some working definitions. The questions at stake are informed by my own interests and experiences, and in this sense, they are questions that I ask myself. I am lucky to have the opportunity to introduce three people whose work I respect very much and who are to speak to what I believe are shared concerns. I will introduce the panelists briefly before moving on to um, a series of question and answers. Irene Anastas is an artist and active organizer of the New York-based group um, Artist Collective 16 Beaver. Irene returns consistently to mapping and to documentation in the archive as strategies that make visible those dimensions of everyday life and public and political discourse that generally remain only partially articulated or acknowledged. A work from 2004, Pasolini Pa Palestine, draws on Pasolini's script for the Gospel according to St. Matthew as a roadmap for revisiting a contemporary Palestine. In other works, the conversations gleaned over extended periods of travel in Palestine and the US have served in turn as a medium for further elaboration in the realized works themselves. Tirdad Zohader is a curator and writer. He is the author of Soft Core, published in 2007, a novel which tells the story of San, a self-proclaimed beatnik and Yale art graduate who is forced into the double life of a secret agent while back in Tehran opening a art gallery. Zohader has curated events in a wide range of venues, most recently the United Arab Emirates National Pavilion at the Venice Biennial, um, and the long-term project Lapdogs of the Bourgeoisie with Nav Haq. He teaches at the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College and is a curatorial advisor to the Artist Pension Trust and the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi. Um, Zohader is also a founding member of the Shahrazad Collective 
and has filmed and directed the documentaries Tehran 1380 uh, with Solmaz Shahbazi and Tropical Modernism in 2006. Boris Groys is a philosopher, essayist, art critic, and media theorist. He's also a dedicated teacher. He currently serves as Global Distinguished Professor of Russian and Slavic Studies at NYU and is a many-time curator and exhibition organizer. Perhaps most of all, he is a prolific author, best known in the US for The Total Art of Stalin. Um, his writing straddles various idioms, and um, most recently, he has focused on the intersection of media, religion, art, and the politics of representation. His publication of 2008 is titled Art Power. So I think we'll begin with um, Boris Groys. Um, there's a passage in the essay, Art at War, from Art Power, which um, was interesting. You lay out a twofold goal for contemporary criticism in that passage. You say, quote, first, this criticism should be directed against all kinds of censorship and suppression of images that would prevent us from being confronted with the reality of war and terror. But at the same time, you say, we are in need of criticism that analyzes the use of these images of violence as the new icons of the political sublime, and that analyzes the symbolic and even commercial competition for the strongest image. And it seems to me that the context of art is especially appropriate for this second kind of criticism." Unquote. Um, beginning with this, a passage as a point of departure. Um, it seems to me you're arguing that media is where we now turn for overwhelming, immediately persuasive images, and that the diversity of images and the historicity of art practice qualifies it as a site, framework, and technique for comparison and critique. Um, I think this is contextualizing that quote in the larger essay. I'm wondering if how you understand um, art offering, at best, an effective critique of the power of visual representation per se? Um, and do you s understand the contemporary art world as a site where these images are most effectively contested? Is there a specificity to art practice that distinguishes it from critical practice? Well, uh... This text, uh, Art at War, was uh, written some years ago. Uh, it's not uh, quite fresh text. And it was written at the peak of uh, uh, war on terror and all the rhetorics and media hype that was uh, connected to it. And also under impression of some conversation and some encounters that I had at that time with people in Israel, because I made some project in Israel at that time, but also uh, in the Palestine territories and Ramallah, but also in Germany, because that was the time I was living in Germany still, um, and so uh, it was kind of part of um, uh, certain European art milieus. So what was uh, striking for me at that time was that, first of all, these certain images, all the same images, yeah, were repeated and quote and repeat and quote again uh, by the international media. You saw them on the old-timer screens of your, of your uh, TV, uh, TV sets and so on and so on. And the, general mood uh, and general commentary sounded like, look at it, and if you look at it, if you look at these images, you understand the truth. You understand what our political situation is, where the world actually came, and what actually happens. So not only some kind of factual or documentary truth, not we show you what happened that time, this day, under these circumstances, factually. But there was some kind of claim of a substantial and even ontological truth. Yeah, truth, the claims that went further uh, 
deep into the what I characterize as text political sublime. So the idea of what is really there, terrible, ugly, uh, unbearable, but look at it and you understand the world in all its tragedy. So that's one thing that kind of impressed me and was strange for me. Strange for me because you suddenly raise this claim after so many years of um, crit crit critical representation. And this claim was almost uh, generally accepted by a, lo a lot of people also in Europe. The second thing that irritated me at that time was a certain aesthetization of the same images in the European art milieus and a certain, uh, how I would say, a certain feeling that these images go far beyond everything that art uh, is capable to do. So these images, in a certain way, are so powerful. They are so radical and they are so omnipresent that art um, uh, lost any sense. You can't do art in, in, the neighbor, in, in, the, in the vicinity of these images because art can only lose. Yeah. So the feeling uh, that art is about looking for radicality, about a competition for the, most strong, for the strongest image, and this competition that allegedly started with, uh, with the avant-garde uh, now, now being lost. So my immediate reaction to both these claims was in that I can only summarize at the moment because I don't have a lot of time to expand on that, is, is an attempt to um, rewrite the history of avant-garde and modernism in terms of describing them as a practice of, as, as I uh, characterize that in this text, uh, politics of equal aesthetic rights. So that actually, uh, strategy of avant-garde modernism was not um, uh, looking for the most radical, uh, most far-going, and most uh, cruel and destructive image, but for the establishing of certain kind of uh, as a machine of neutralization of all these kind of claims. Yeah? All kind of claims of not only to produce a masterpiece of genius, but also to, to produce any strongest image at all. Uh, this uh, equalizing machine, this machine of skepticism in relationship to any claim of this kind, um, I, uh, I thought we have to renew uh, that, we have to criticize these images, not only in political terms, and not only in social terms, and not only in these terms and that terms, but also in terms of this traditional, already traditional for us, uh, strategy of avant-garde and modernism, a uh, certain kind of modernism, a certain kind of avant-garde, that relativize all these uh, claims to truth and exclusivity. So that was in general the idea. And maybe just, uh, yeah, maybe just one anecdote from, uh, from the time that was kind of uh, substantiated what I saw. Uh, I was uh, delivered, I, I delivered this text as lecture in uh, Tel Aviv and Ramallah. Uh, uh, without without uh, changing it. And it's interesting that so both audiences, I was confronted with the same question. We are waiting, both audiences, absolutely the first question was the same. We are waiting for Goya, and we are waiting uh, for Picasso, so that the world could know our suffering. How long should we wait for this great artist? Yeah? And I think this question itself is also what uh, stimulated me to, 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 to launch this discussion. So this is one uh, product of this discussion. Um, if I could just ask one follow-up question about the, the timeliness of this essay or the lack thereof. Do you think that the situation has fundamentally changed in terms of what people expect of 
um, the relationship between art and an engagement with mediatized images? Uh, I think that we are accustomed to a certain kind of situation, but I, and this feeling that we are accustomed to it, uh, it's already kind of changed. Uh, but station itself uh, didn't change, haven't changed uh, really, uh, in both aspects. First of all, we do not still expect from art strong images, and we tend to think that our is a loser, art is a loser in the competition with media, and we still uh, we still uh, use uh, this iconography, a certain iconography of terror and war uh, against terror as, as a true political representation uh, of our time, as of, of what, what our world essentially is. Yeah? Uh, even if we do that in critical terms, we still appeal to this iconography as generally known and generally accepted as being as such. Yeah? You can't criticize in, in understandable terms only something that you assume uh, is accepted by everybody more or less in the same degree. And I think that is what happens today still. Thank you. Um, I guess we'll turn next to um, Irene and a discussion that we had some weeks ago, which was um, about the nature of collective work um, as an artist and your work as an artist. Um, you say, 16 Beaver, which is a form of activity and practice, not necessarily mine nor anyone's artwork. It is an important practice in relation to developing an open-ended project, not one not related to one result nor defined by a product, and autonomous economically and content-wise. It allows for things to happen. Um, I'm wondering, in relation to um, this perspective, what you feel that the condi conditions are that sustain or nurture or allow this kind of collective, um, collective artwork, um, collective practice, and open-ended practice, um, and what is the relationship of this mode of working to uh, a political um, either understanding or aim or um, position? interested in the question you're asking, I think, that went out in the invite and initially about the human rights question. Well, I'm not sure where to start. Uh, I'm not sure where to start, but yeah. Um, I, had, I had actually prepared a little bit a note about the question of human rights but I don't know if it's interesting no, for go you. Ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, because it's a, it's, it's, it's a, maybe it may allow me slowly to enter the, the realm of artistic practice obliquely. Um, it's uh, in relation to um, the question, I think your question was this, uh, why are invocations of trauma, prejudice, and marginality in the art world so resonant and the question of ending the um, um, the affair, human rights, and, and for me, it's. I would like to clarify this question of human rights, where um, something is wrong with the notion of human rights. It feels like um, it, that needs to be worked out, and I think a few people wrote about it, including um, Hannah Arendt at. at uh, at some point, uh, uh, also, um, Giorgio Agamben quotes her, and uh, he's explaining that basically there is a crisis that persists until today, and uh, that arose in Europe um, uh, after the uh, First World War, which is the, the figure, the rise of the figure of the refugee. And um, it, they were thinking, well, the, the rights of the citizen, the nation state. And, and this figure of the refugee has in it basically all these things that you're talking about, the, the trauma, the marginality, and, and the, the prejudice. 
And uh, uh, the fear of the refugee shows us also the separation of, of the rights, so-called rights of man, from the rights of the citizen. Because as soon as this person is outside uh, the nation state, is denaturalized, or uh, I don't know how to say it, is not a citizen anymore, um, there is the crisis of this, what are these rights then? No? And, and it's, a, it's a philosophical question from like a while back, maybe I'm going too far <laughs> in the theory, but uh, what, what Agamben describes also about the separation of natural life and political life from each other. And um, I think it's a question that still persists and, and the question is how, how to work with that. And uh, uh, Agamben gives a funny example about, uh, which is not so funny, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's specifically about, let's say, uh, the problem of Palestine and Israel. He says, well, instead of thinking about two nation states uh, separating uh, from each other with a border, why not think about uh, one territory shared and um, two political communities with the right, is not the right to the citizen, but the right to the refugee, basically, Imagining always the outside inside. Can, so, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, do so you, I'm going. <laughs> right. Sorry. No. It just made me. I mean, you hear a lot nowadays the artist as refugee, maybe the artist as exile, or artist as nomad. These seem to be especially important invocations in terms of understanding what the artist is at yeah. this moment. Um, how do you, why do you think that is the case? And do you think that, um, do you think that it has anything to do with um, a situation in the art world specifically, rather than a situation in the political sphere? Well, the artist as, as refugee, um um, I, can you say more about the, art, the figure of, of the artist as a refugee, basically well, um, identifying or...? Well, it's, uh, it's something that you sort of picked up on as an important reference. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's also something that you, you hear a lot, I think, um, in terms of framing exhibitions or, um, uh, or framing discussions about what the art world is. and. Uh, there's this idea of mobility, but also um, kind of a, I the word refugee has sort of a distinct political or um, it's, it's that not may just be, about. Hmm. Do you think it resonates with, with this notion of refugee that is basically the, the, the life that is excluded from the political? Do you, because maybe it's more, sometimes in the art world there are uh, uh, there are wandering uh, kind of notions that are on the way emptied from their content. I mean, the artist uh, uh, mobility is, is is very different than the refugee, uh, the refugees kind of uh, exile or or right. being without those those rights. I don't know. I, I mean, I would definitely agree with you. Um, I'm I'm interested in why you think that that those two that those two concepts, then the artist and, and the refugee, which are obviously very different, or the artist and the exile, seem to be invoked so, so often today as, as um, part of the same kind of category or and an attempt to try and Maybe understand. Maybe it's the idea of the artist as being outside, which goes back to your question about the role of, of the artists mm -hmm. and creating the conditions. Uh, what are because you're asking what are the conditions of, of uh, creating art that is sustainable? I mean, I think it's also seeing for me it's important not to see um, the being an, an artist as outside of the world. It's on the contrary, the more in in the world, being in the world, and what that means uh, is to understand what is exactly going on, and how can I analyze this reality, this crazy reality that we are living in on many levels and in many ways. Uh, it is necessary to analyze in order to place oneself. In a way, the artist has to create 
uh, her, her or his own reality. Um, but first, by understanding the, the actual world that we are living in. Saying just a refugee, then I would need more uh, precise definition of how, t I, I don't see uh, a point, maybe the point is what I explained, is one has to see oneself as a citizen in exile in order to kind of include the excluded within that construction of the nation state. Maybe I went too far to come back to this kind of role um, uh, of the artist in creating these conditions um, where one understands oneself as part of the reality. I mean, one can see an artist uh, you know, um, as being outside, creating a reality outside, but I don't see it this way. And I don't see it also as a kind of representation of the reality. I don't see art and artist as, this is my notion. I mean, I'm not imposing it on anybody. It's not about it. It's more about complicating the relation between reality and what one is doing. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, am I 10 minutes already? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm the time. Uh, yeah, I don't know, because I, maybe I didn't get to uh, a point I wanted to bring about, which is the question of form and how artists uh, should be a creator of form, but what kind of form uh, are we talking about? And um, there are two kinds of form, let's say, according to um, Deleuze, according to Foucault, which is the form of the visible and the form of whatever can be articulated. And so for me, I would like to go beyond the confinement of an art world and what it is, because I don't see the art world as separate from the world, and I'd rather go uh, on a bigger, a much larger task in my thinking to be able to act in, the, in a way that I feel not alienated from myself and for my other fellow human beings, friends and comrades and everybody. So um, I think he explains exactly how it's, it's, it's the, the form that, that power is created in the world. It's a diagram of forces. That's how Deleuze explains Foucault. Uh, so that we don't feel overwhelmed that we are all controlled in, let's say, in the prison for, for Deleuze, for Foucault. The, the prison is just a kind of a form of, uh, it's the visible form of, of something, of, um, uh, uh, and, and the discourse on, uh, or the law of, um, the penal law is the, the one that is written. And so it's the, it's the school and education, NYU and the program. <laughs> So it's not about to, to say, well, this is good or bad. It's more understanding things more loosely and to be able to understand these forces and how what he calls then the both forms form diagrams that are spatial and temporal, and how we can act within these forms and possibly create our own diagrams, pull and push and see what's going on. Okay. No, thank you. Um, that takes us to quite nicely to Tear Dad. And um, I wanted to ask you about your, uh, your forms as a curator. Um, your exhibitions, Ethnic Marketing and Lapdogs of the Bourgeoisie, deal with art world definitions of an inside and an outside in relation to ethnicity and class, respectively. Um, the art world that is um, at the same time an art market mobilizes both ethnicity and class. Um, reflecting on the nature of that mobilization allows us to read against the grain the nature of the art world. Um, this is one way of reading, perhaps, what you're doing in those, um, those two projects. Um, why, in your opinion, this is a very <laughs> sort of basic question, but is it important to stage exhibitions and projects that perform this kind of reading. And um, another distinct characteristic of your approach, um, it seems to me, is the use of satire. And um, I'm wondering what would be lost if that particular strategy was not used. Um, well, we'd, ha we'd have to, it would kind of divert the discussion because I would I would argue with you whether satire was really a leitmotif in those in those shows, but that would uh, we can have that conversation after the panel. Um, I think I think what could be uh, helpful is to point out why you 
shouldn't do exhibitions such as ethnic marketing. Um, and one reason is that it was, um, maybe to briefly explain, it was, it was a project which was very closely related to, to what Claire is uh, uh, inviting us to speak about today. Um, it was trying to trace what happens to art that is imported from a so-called outside. Um, how this is uh, marketed, circulated, discussed, um, not only from an outside, meaning south or east, but also from here to the outside, uh, New York, the center of the real. You can imagine an artist uh, traveling from here to uh, the Middle East, let's say. And what happens uh, aesthetically, politically, epistemologically um, when this project at some point uh, winds up here in New York. So th this was a group show in Geneva and in Tehran a couple of years after uh, the Geneva Kunsthal show. So uh, I, think, I think what failed in that project is that I didn't, um, retrospectively, there was not enough attention paid to format. Um, and that led to the art in the show becoming an illustration of the curatorial theme. This might seem slightly beside the point, but it isn't. Um, I think that this discussion around the inside and outside and whether uh, the iconicity of a particular phenomenon um, is instrumentalized in some way or another by the arts uh, cannot be divorced from the question of format, from uh, what uh, the, the curator has decided to do with and through uh, and via the, the, the art. Um, that, was, that was one uh, thing that I wanted to uh, point out as far as ethnic marketing is concerned. The other is uh, that it didn't, um, it didn't raise the, the question of uh, the production of knowledge rigorously enough. Precisely th by way of this, this format of the group show, the themed group show, you have a nicely written introduction to an exhibition catalog, the art more or less you know, responds to this. Um, there is, there is a, a particular uh, assumption involved that uh, the, the, the artist uh, can respond to a theme even as colossal as you know, art in a globalized context um, without any sort of checks and balances whatsoever. Um, and of course, this is, a, this is a privilege that the arts have fought hard and long to attain, and, and so it would be kind of, uh, uh, you know, reactionary to question that perhaps. Um, but I, 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 I am wondering now uh, at a time when, if you look at biennial statements, biennial curatorial statements, which are omni-concerned and um, pan, uh, you know, pan-specialized, uh, um, whether there is no space where the art world can be expected to sit down and shut up. Um, and I think that this, this um, what I'm implying is a discussion around specificity um, and, and calling people on uh, where, why, and how uh, they are entitled to speak about what they're they're speaking um, about, and and that is um, I could I could uh, drone on endlessly about this. Do, do I have Do I have <laughs> you another, have another minute five minutes if you'd okay. like to? Okay, um, I was thinking uh, I was thinking during the introduction to this panel when uh, Bidoon was introduced as as one of the hosts of, of this evening. Um, that I, I, I was one of the editors of Bidoon magazine for a little while. Um, since then, I've been writing a little more for, for Freeze magazine. And perhaps that's an interesting uh, comparison. Uh, Freeze is, is uh, what I would call a model of uh, uh, enlightened ethnocentrism. Uh, it stands up for this, and it doesn't apologize for it, and it kind of is what it is. Um, and it makes an effort to here and there add, uh, you know, whatever calls for um, a little bit of a multiplicity, multiplicity of perspectives, but there's a very unapologetic, we are a European magazine, or Euro, Euro American magazine. Um, Bidoon, by comparison, is a more convoluted phenomenon. It's, uh, it's trying to, it's, it's, um, it's, it's a balancing act. It's attempting to uh, convey to a European audience or a Euro-American audience that it is actually not the target 
audience, but that it's on the outside looking in. Um, and that the actual audience is an audience based outside somewhere. Whereas the opposite is the case. Um, actually, the European, the, the Euro-American audience is the target audience. Um, and this, um, this is a complication which can be actually very attractive. Um, you can say that you can sink your teeth into it. There's a lot there to think about, deconstruct, work with. Um, I, I do think so. But it does, uh, it's, it is quite uh, tricky um, because through this backflip, um, you distract uh, readers from the issues of, you know, well, format for one thing, but the other is uh, specificity of who is speaking for what, uh, where, what, why, um, and who. Um, and this is this is uh, this is something which which um, can I. I I, I, I keep saying that I'm going to wind up uh, running around in, in corduroy suits um, and quoting Clement Greenberg, uh, but I think that uh, specificity is something which which is uh, key in this in this whole conversation, and it'll haunt it um, until it's addressed in in a, in a more or less rigorous way. I could end with one anecdote if I have the time. Um, I was I I, wo I worked closely with a, with a, um, an artist who who's now in Frankfurt but was based in Tehran for the longest time called Shahab Fotuhi, and um, he in Tehran has this reputation of being uh, the political artist and everyone sort of like you know teases him oh well, what slogan are you going to come up with now and your work is you know the, the political one-liners and so on and so forth so he decided to sort of up the ante and he did this project in Tehran before the elections which was a panel um, where he invited the main campaign uh, participants of uh, the Musavi campaign the op what is widely called the opposition campaign, uh, and it became a panel discussion as artwork. He turned the gallery into uh, a campaign bureau. Okay, so he did this project, um, and it was very interesting in the discussion of Tehran, in the political context, in the context of how his work was received, etc. Then he got the possibility to show this in Istanbul at the Biennial to document this project, and I. Um, I kind of uh, uh, bitched at him by email, uh, pushing and prodding him and telling him not to, uh, saying, calling him all sorts of names like Al Jazeera, and saying that this would reduce his artwork to a curatorial gimmick, um, and obviously he would get a career break. Obviously, if Okwi, Hans Ulrich, if any of these guys see this thing, they'll be salivating, they'll love it. Um, and obviously, it's gonna, you know, how can you, how can you get any better? It's a, you know, panel discussion of an imprisoned opposition or nearly imprisoned opposition leader as artwork, etc. Um, after discussions with the curators there, he decided not to show this work, um, and uh, irrespectively of my uh, nagging. Um, but this this kind of brings quite a few issues to the fore. Not only the issue of his artwork being reduced to a documentation of a tragic affair, a violent affair, a traumatic affair, um, but also my prerogative, my uh, privileged position to sit uh, in Berlin where I'm based and to judge which artwork is worthy um, of being uh, shown in a context outside Tehran. Um, it sort of packages things in this, in this quite intricate way, so I wanted to add that to the discussion. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think the question of specificity is really important and who's speaking for whom and under what conditions and to which audiences. And, um, and they're, they're, that's different from other kinds of questions about specificity related to artwork. But it's, um, I think it's definitely central to this panel and um, to the whole series. So I'd like to invite you as panelists to address a question or comment to each other um, with response or, or not, as, as case may be. Um, 
Uh, maybe beginning with you again, Tirdad, and then going backwards, Irene and, and Boris after that. I, 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 was, I have a very simple question. I just didn't get to, um, I, would, I would love to know more about what Irene meant by working with form, maybe with, through an example or such. It seemed very broad, I, if you could go into that. I think uh, form, as the Luz explains it from Foucault, was, um, uh, it's, it's the visible form or the form, the, the discursive form, what can be said or what can be built. So there is always uh, two parts to to this uh, kind of uh, uh, let's say what he calls a diagram, and uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, there are statements and there is the environment, no? and what you can influence the environment with a statement, and vice versa. No? So it's it's uh, abstract, but uh, I mean. Uh, Architects work with 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 like uh, one can understand it like that. There's a form to a building, and then there's a function to it. The two are separate, yet they are interrelated. There is the school, and there's a program to the school. No? There's a, a building that looks like this, and then there is and then the 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 thing about it why it's interesting is that. Um, what he says about the panopticon, no? the, the, that it is built in a way that, let's say, um, uh, the people, the prisoners, are seen without being able to see each other, or the ones uh, that are seeing them. And the aim of this is, and of the kind of uh, discursive element, which is the juri juridical, um, the, the law, the penal law, is basically to create a kind of um, way of behavior. No? It's like forming, forming of behavior, forming of a subject. No? So it's interesting in a way, cre about thinking about creating form uh, and thinking about the social field, because all these forms are finding themselves in the social field. And for me, an ideal situation is, is that we don't confine ourselves to, because we are ourselves a lot of times subject to this kind of uh, discursive, whether when we are at school, we have several forces acting on us, on the way we are behaved, the way I'm talking now. Um, so just to, to be able to be aware of them and kind of try to see, well, what is it that I want to do here? And possibly to do it collectively. And this is just, a, I thought, a, a small detail of, oh, it's interesting, um, but not, not the only one. I'm sure one can approach it in many ways. Uh, the question of subjectivation is very interesting, um, and what it means, uh, and how do we relate to it. It's another thing. <laughs> but is, is that Are helpful, uh, Tirtad? A little yeah, more helpful. I'm, I'm struck by a certain a rehabilitation or uh, of the idea of form, or or a, a rekindling of discussions around form and circles, where before it was more of a, uh, a, a you know a, a reason for raised eyebrows and oh you're interested in you're just interested in form it used to mean something very form. different. It's becoming it's there's there's more and more of a, a thirst for discussions around something defined as form. Um, and and I was, so I was just curious to hear more. Yeah, I think it's important to be aware uh, uh, of language and how it's important to say what we mean in, in cases like that because it can mean a lot of things probably for different people. Irene, did you want to address a question to, um, to either of the other panelists? Yeah, and maybe open-ended, something that's interesting that makes some chemistry somehow, because it feels like we're isolated entities. I mean, it's starting a little bit, but um, yeah, I mean, we can soon open also to the public, or maybe Boris, uh, what is interesting to you in, in being in, in, in the art context as a thinker? What, what do you think about, I mean, I'm jumping, just asking a general question because I find it interesting. Uh, 
Wh where is your hope in, from art? I mean, I know hope is a little uh, difficult. Uh, I don't mean it in a religious way, but I mean it in a... I feel like in a, we, we, we kind of live in, a, in difficult times. Maybe it's all the times are difficult times. I mean, in Russia in 1970s, I'm sure it was a <laughs> difficult time. And, uh, every, every decade is difficult. So the question, of course, for me, it's always about the relation between this difficulty and our being artists, acting as thinkers and artists. So it's a very open-ended question. So. Uh, well, I really got involved uh, with art in the uh, Russian 70s. And um, if you are living in a society with uh, kind of dominating ideologies that formulate very strong uh, truth claims, mm -hmm. then of course you can react to that in two different ways. You can formulate your own truth against this official truth. Yeah? So truth against truth. And that is a kind of position that was very widespread at the time, as a kind of dissident attitude. Um, that was not my attitude at that time. I was more interested uh, personally in looking at this whole spectacle uh, of Soviet power as being simply an image and being uh, simply a, um, a spectacle. So, aestheticizing the political uh, has a bad, uh, you know, kind of connotations, I know, uh, since that word was used by, uh, by uh, Walter Benjamin in a kind of uh, pejorative and negative way. But under certain conditions, uh, aestheticization of politics uh, can be very healing and can be very helpful. It can be very helpful because it removes the truth claim of the ideology. And at the same time, you are not under obligation to formulate your own truth. Yeah? You can criticize things by aestheticizing them without formulating any counter position. And it's not because uh, you are afraid to uh, formulate this position but because the strategy simply seems uh, more interesting and more productive. Now, if I'm listening to Tirdat and this example of this uh, Iranian guy that he mentioned, I see fundamentally, and I was uh, also involved in, in some, um, I have some overview of Iranian art practices last year, um, I have a feeling this kind of aestheticization of the political uh, also takes place uh, there. And that is a good example. On so one hand, if you use a political panel as uh, a pure form, as an artwork, you bring some political content in art, into art field. And that seems to be a very serious gesture. On the, one, on the other hand, it's a kind of subverting the seriousness and the pathos of this political event, just showing it as a pure performance. Yeah. Now, if you show it as a pure performance and then you compare that with the powerful images yeah, of people being beaten and being even killed on the streets in Tehran, then it seems to, to be extremely yeah, not serious enough, yeah, as you said, yeah. Uh, it seems to be kind of um, frivolous, too frivolous, too frivolous. On the other hand, as I already said before, we have to have a nerve. Maybe it seems to be cynical, but it is not. We have to have a nerve to see all the images as images. And if we see that, if we have a nerve to a relativize all the images, whatever ethical truth content they have, and whatever insistence they are manifest to push on our certain ideology. If they have a nerve to say, okay, but that's only an image, like any other image, you can change the light, you can remove this figure, and it's a digital. Uh, manipulation and exchange biases. 
you save yourself at, at least for a certain kind of uh, political indoctrination. And it seems to me that it's not a bad, at least in my 70s, <laughs> it was not a bad strategy. And it seems to me it is not a bad strategy still in many ways. Can I, uh, I, I wanted to add something quickly. Boris reminded me of uh, a statement he once made in a documentary film made by an artist called Dirk Herzog just a few years ago, uh, called, uh, a film called Multi Dudes, not Multitudes, but Multi Dudes. And it, uh, in it, there was this implicit assumption of art being able to change things in society at large for the better. Um, and Boris was interviewed and um, he, as a response, uh, quoted a statistic of uh, Durkheim's, who, who uh, correct me if I'm wrong here, but he, um, he was investigating suicides uh, in a given city, and uh, he was saying that throughout all sorts of crises, the rate of suicides were stable, except when there was a major art exhibition in town. He, uh, it, was, it was a very fitting sort of, um, the, the artist put it at the very beginning of his film, and uh, it's, it's a very simple and even more basic assumption which also is connected to what we're talking about here because when you ask the question of whether art can undermine official and officious representations, there's an implicit assumption that art is on the, good, on the right side of things and that art is perhaps uh, inclined to undermine these representations. Um, whereas actually if you look at it empirically you would wonder why art of all things uh, would be would be uh, handed this this job or this responsibility. Um, it's it's often uh, a lot more uh, instructive to to look at art in terms of its complicity with uh, the powers that that, that be. The more uh, one one interesting example of late is its complicity with the the the, the, the rampant or the uh, success of post Fordism as a, an ideology of capitalism of late and the contributions of art during the 60s. So art did make a big difference in the big wide world, but not necessarily in, this, um, in the way we'd like it to. Well, I, uh, I definitely agree with you. Uh, I, th I think that art is often, it's often given that privilege of being on the right side, whereas that, and that gets mobilized um, precisely to make it do certain kinds of work. Um, so yeah, I, I would agree with you. Are we talking about art in general? Because it's, I have a difficulty with understanding art in general. For me, I'm speaking from my own position as artist and the art I would like to see. I mean, it's like talking about the word community and everyone will understand it differently. And some people say, hey, come on, don't use it. It's antiquated, this and that. And there's several thinkers thinking about the word community. And because we are always situated somewhere in our thought and our real uh, being in the world in relation to everything. So I, don't know, I just wanted to say that uh, what I would like is a very more specific, you spoke about specificity, like more how you see it, what would you like it to be for you, and what does it do for you, and in those questions, you know? The question of well, I think, I think uh, yeah, that is, that is worth pointing out. In, in uh, panels such as ours, I, I mean, I assume that the art that is uh, at play within all of our statements is the kind of art that is uh, produced, commissioned, circulated within these arenas that traditionally have some kind of an investigatory promise beyond the market, uh, meaning, you know, biennales, artist-run spaces, Kunsthallen, um, and which which are spaces which are very quickly losing this uh, this promise and this this uh, sparkle. And I think that the reason is uh, has has a lot to do with what we've been talking about uh, today, with certain inflationary claims of what art can do. Um, and, and also a, a disregard of a form of the material format at hand uh, through which these discussions, circulations, commissions, uh, productions un unfold. Um, so that, that, I mean, in a way that, um, that introduces the, the art that, that maybe vaguely hints at the kind of art that I would like to see. I would like to see what uh, a Stockholm-based critic called Charlotte Bidler uh, use the term clash consciousness, 
um, which is uh, very nice. It, she was uh, talking about uh, just this perpetual reminding uh, uh, of oneself that there's this gulf between theory and practice that uh, it unfolds the more ambitious you get in your in your claims and statements. Um, and this is uh, this is something that I would I would hugely let's let's I mean if I'm I mainly work as a curator so maybe you know instead of saying this is what I would like artists to do. I would maybe, um, uh, I'd better say, this is what I really want curators to do. Um, and and uh, the, the particular type of self-reflexivity, um, which, which uh, has, has, uh, has gone missing of late. Well, maybe speaking about the right side, yeah. Um, of course, complicity. But um, uh, artists is, uh, also, if he's complicit with power, uh, it's very dangerous and ambiguous and dangerous for this power. Look, look at the examples of, for example, Leni Riefenstahl. Yeah? Leni Riefenstahl loved Hitler yeah, and made something good for him. But actually, uh, from now, as we looking at her movies, uh, it is the most, uh, uh, most radical, um, actually, the construction yeah, of the whole uh, Hitlerian image. And actually, uh, in one of my last shows, I uh, showed uh, an artist, uh, you probably know him, Barbat Golshiri, uh, from Tehran, who made a very interesting uh, collage of Ayatollahs uh, speaking uh, publicly and shown uh, in, uh, uh, through, uh, through TV. Uh, of course, it was uh, uh, produced as a kind of glorification, but it looked at a parody. So. Um, you, uh, I, I don't think that the artist can control the image. That's what I mean. Yeah. The artist can't control the image. Even curator can control the image. And we, we, we can produce the image. Yeah. We can show the image, but we can control it. And we can control the interpretation. So it's always a kind of lurking danger, is that. And that's what I like about it. Yeah. Our art has this kind of subversive power, even if we don't uh, see it in the first. Yeah, first game. Um, so this is a question relating to the um, human rights as invoked in the title of the panel, and um, if you don't mind, it's a, it's a double whammy question. It's half for Irene, half for Teardod. Um, I think the person in you know, the art world, as we'll use that term, uh, who sort of made the most explicit claim that there's some relationship between contemporary art and human rights would be Okui Amazor, right? Uh, you know, he's an essay where he's ma made the argument um, that, that human that? rights... Sorry, what? Who said that? Okui Enwazor? Okui. Mm -hmm. Okui. Um, you know, and he's made the, made the argument that the ethical compass for contemporary art currently is the culture of human rights. Um, you know, that, that's his claim. And then there, I think there's this sort of question that I'd like to put to you, Irene, uh, because I maybe could see that sort of claim working uh, in a project of yours like Camp Campaign, you know. Uh, are you in accordance with that? Do you see that as a sort of um, driving force, at least behind your work, and then more generally practitioners that you're interested in? And then, um, Teardot, my second half of the question, um, it comes as kind of no surprise, if Okuyenwazor is the person who makes this claim, when he has an opportunity to exhibit or organize a documenta, he, do he creates a documenta with 600 hours worth of video. Uh, because, you know, video, of course, it lines up perfectly with sort of media image. It can be relating to documentary. Um, all these things that seem to have a much more direct relationship to a sort of uh, global human rights culture, um, you know, than, than say a sort of ab abstract painting, right? And I'm curious whether part of your um, corduroy fantasy of becoming a neo-Greenbergian has something to do with the facility or lack of facility of mediums other than, say, film and video to reflect some of these global eye or concerns about globalism or ethics um, that flow through contemporary art discourse these days. Yeah, um, yeah I think it's not too far. Uh, it's, it's, I think this question of human rights came up 
uh, exactly during this camp campaign. Okay, let me explain maybe what is camp campaign. Is a project I did together with uh, Rene Gabri, we um, who is here. We traveled across the U.S. with a question, and that was uh, how is it possible that a place uh, camp uh, like Guantanamo Bay can exist in our times, and. Uh, uh, it's exactly the, the critique of the discourse on human rights, but I'm not sure I would be critiquing Okwi here because I think his desire may be directed towards the political as such, and, and maybe sometimes, I, I, I mean, I, I just talk, took it as an opportunity to, to say, well, one has to be careful when one says human rights, not to think of human rights just as thinking about uh, uh, the prisoners in Guantanamo of like, uh, in the Michael Moore sicko, he goes to Guantanamo, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it, and he says, well, look, e even the, the Guantanamo prisoners have better better uh, health care than the U.S. citizens. It's, it's a joke, of course. But this is not what they need. They don't need uh, humanitarian help only. They need to be seen as political subjects, and that's precisely the problem. And uh, the problem goes on and on uh, in this figure of the refugee, uh, the migrants in Europe. And we were trying to find analogies uh, in history and in uh, our current time in the U.S. So, yeah, I think um, it's not far from uh, what we, our desire. Yeah. But I don't know if it's, if it's not clear. Um, okay, the, 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 I guess there's a, there's a, there's there are different ways to respond to that. One one way is to um, point out that um, 600 hours of video uh, is, I mean, even the most ardent grad student would not spend a fraction of that time looking at this uh, material. And um, it's it's uh, it's what 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 it, what it does. Um, Produce, however, is, is not an artistic argument nor a political one, but a sort of uh, a representation thereof, a representation of a political engagement, an artistic engagement, which is not the same thing. And um, this, is, this is, of course, not a cardinal sin, uh, not because it's, it's, it's perfectly fine, but because it's done everywhere. It's become uh, expected of a biennial. If a biennial only had six hours, God forbid, it would be seen as lazy, um, mainly as lazy, mainly as lazy, and also as perhaps favoritist, because certain ar certain artists were privileged when you could have had six hundred of them. Um, and this this is the this is the uh, limitations of um, engagement with format, which which frustrate me much more than the limitations of video. Um, it's the engagement of what a biennial uh, uh, can can uh, do. Uh, what, it, what it has been doing, uh, not de jure, but de facto, um, and what it potentially could do with, with uh, gestures that are not even, I mean, you had this revolutionary gesture of the Manifesto 6, which tried to turn the whole biennial format into a process-based affair, and that was fantastic, didn't happen, but it doesn't even have to be quite as, as um, spectacular um, as that, it's it's uh, what it, uh, the curator Anselm Franke compared biennials to uh, Italian operas uh, by way of uh, in terms of how much reflexivity is allowed, um, which is very little. And so this is, I mean, I was, that's the direction I was I was aiming at. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I think we're getting a, a little bit. Um, over time, but I, I do want to, and we can continue later um, with the reception, but if there's perhaps one more question um, before we move in. Tiradad, can I redirect Irene's question to Boris to you? Do you have a hope for art? <laughs> I mean, I have, I have, yeah, that's a good one. Did you say for or in? Uh, <laughs> in 
I mean, if I if I didn't have any any hope in or for art, I wouldn't I wouldn't be sitting here. I would be in a field where I could make better money than than the arts. Um, uh, we also we all say that, but I mean, at the end of the true, the at the end of the reasons, it's true. At the end of the God, this is this really has been a long day. At the end of the day, it's true, uh, as as banal as as it may be. If it's, it's perhaps uh, for, for for lack of a better idea, I mean, if I could, I've worked as a journalist, I've dabbled in the documentary, a film field, uh, and the way that that questions are are dealt with uh, do not have the unpredictability that they do within the arts. Um, so, and, and this, uh, this not only regards these grander questions that we've been dealing with today, but also in terms of what is actually produced. Um, it is more incommensurable, it is less predictable what is happening in this field. Um, but but this, this unpredictability um, is flipping over into this, into this blank check which, which I'm starting to get very irritated by and which is creating more, it's, it's becoming uh, part of the problem. Uh, maybe that answers your question halfway. You look skeptical. So I think that, um, I, I would say so. I have a hope to, to learn from art what is hope because actually it's not very clear to me what is despair, and also in relationship to human rights. Yeah, what is actually human? How you identify human? It's very, uh, very Foucauldian, and also problem. So I think that art is uh, for me always something that I can ask, and I, I always have a hope to have an interesting uh, question, uh, to an uh, interesting answer, uh, answer to my question. Yeah, uh, this kind of hope I always had, and uh, I still have it. Political right. I would claim political right is better than human rights. This way. <laughs> what is politics? Yeah. So and and and, 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 and uh, I think art is interesting terrain. Is it maybe only one terrain? It's not philosophy anymore. It's almost not philosophy anymore. For me, art is experimental philosophy. It's something like gives us really a material. Yeah, it gives us really experience that can can be used by us to identify all of that, what's politics, what is, what is hope, you know, how you identify hope, how you identify human. Uh, I don't see in our society any other uh, terrain where you can ask this kind of question and to expect any kind of answer. Yeah? I think it's only one. It's not very good you know, one. Yeah? Uh, it's a terrible one even. Yeah? Uh, but uh, it's in a very strange way only one. Hmm. Um, Ileana, did you have a question? No. Um, I have a question about. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're talking about human rights and politics, and I'm, I'm, you know, we're, we're talking about very different patterns of distribution of information. If we're speaking of art, or if it is mass media. So um, it actually, this, this question actually comes from a personal experience. This summer, when I was at the Venice Biennial, I found out that a lot of the tourists that come to the city during the biennial come for the biennial. So I'm, I'm just interested in whether these new, the, these huge platforms for mobilizing art in a political sense have more effect, I guess, now that they happen on such a massive scale, or how, how does that impact the uh, ties with the audience on a very grounded basis, meaning not through secondary media, <laughs> or through um, museums or galleries, but actually directly in a, in a very, I, 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 I see a difference between a biennial and an, an, exi an exhibition in a gallery. So, okay, maybe that's not exactly clear. <laughs> there's, there's a question there, I think, somewhere. So, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> Do, would you like to an answer that, Tirdad, or? Uh, I, yeah, it's it's um, audience. Yeah, audience. Um, <laughs> I always forget that bit. Uh, it's it's I the, the the thing is that in 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 there there are there are um, situations where engaging with the audience can be an extremely uh, 
fruitful exercise for many different reasons, but uh, in, in, in the context of the discussion that we are having today, if I'm perfectly honest, if I'm really honest, I, I um, tend to favor an engagement with the art field itself. I have a feeling that there's a kind of, that it's uh, timely, um, and for, for very uh, simple reasons, um, I, I mean, these, I was talking about biennial specificity. Uh, no biennials, no matter how grand the, the political statements, uh, ever pays the artists, for example. Um, and this is absolutely acceptable um, and very much in the logic of things. It's not a dirty little secret. Uh, and this is, this is uh, I mean, I'm, I'm hinting at a whole set of questions which, uh, which I think to a larger audience would be plain boring. Um, and I think that the, a lot of the questions we were dealing with today uh, come to fruition when there's a more tight, a more, perhaps a little more, dare I say, exclusive uh, discussion among, uh, within the art field. So that's how I would answer your question, although I'm not sure exactly what. Can I just, is it somebody has something or? No, I'll, can I read just something in relation to, because you're saying, what is, the, what is politics about? So I just would like to read something in relation to, since you spoke about truth also, uh, about the model of truth and rela in relation to power and the laws. Uh, it reads like this. there is no model of truth that doesn't refer back to a kind of power and no knowledge or even science that doesn't express or imply in an act power that is being exerted. All knowledge runs from a visible element to an articulable one and vice versa. Yet there is no such thing as a common totalizing form, not even a conformity or by univocal correspondence. There is only a relation of forces which acts transversally and finds in the duality of forms the condition for its own action and realization. So for me, it's more about understanding uh, certain things that's in relation to power and how we understand it and how we understand our place in it and our agency for it. So I don't know, it's because otherwise, if, if we are constantly asking, well, what is this, what is this? It's a little bit, it feels like, oh, well, we are lost. We don't know what is the meaning of anything. So I just didn't want it to be stay hanging in the air. So you are artist, you answer my questions. That is precisely what I <laughs> described. <laughs> and, uh, on that note, I think, uh, well, uh, thank you very much to our panelists. And, um,